The boost burn put our crew in an orbit where Dragon's apogee, or the highest point, will be 10 kilometers lower than the station. After that, we executed the close co-elliptic burn at 4.54 p.m. Pacific time. The close burn placed Dragon on an orbit roughly co-elliptic with the space station, meaning it was maintaining an orbit roughly 10 kilometers lower than the station the entire way around the Earth. That's in contrast to only being 10 kilometers lower than the station during Dragon's apogee, or the highest point in its orbit, which is achieved by the boost burn. From there, at 6.44 p.m. Pacific, we executed the fourth major maneuver known as the transfer burn. This is where we're raising Dragon's apogee, or highest point of its orbit, to just 2.5 kilometers lower than space station. Then we rounded everything out with a final co-elliptic burn at 7.31 p.m. Pacific to once again maintain a constant orbit lower than the space station, this time just 2.5 kilometers below. This was a shorter burn lasting just over 30 seconds. During the approach, SpaceX flight controllers will work in tandem with the NASA team in Houston to maneuver Dragon Endeavor to the proper attitude. They will initialize the navigation sensors used for the methodical approach to station. They'll also activate and test out a number of systems on Dragon, including bidirectional communications with the station using the C2V2 system. C2V2 stands for Common Communications for Visiting Vehicles. It sets up a data stream from Dragon to the station, giving another path for Dragon telemetry to come to to come to the ground and giving an additional command capability to astronauts aboard the station. At approximately 10.03 p.m. Pacific, Draco thrusters on Dragon will fire for the approach. Well, this actually just happened, right? We just had the approach initiation burn here just a couple of minutes ago. Um, and all of that went really smoothly. It helped to swing uh, Dragon about 202.5 kilometers below space station and just about seven kilometers behind it. Uh, and eventually it will help us get to 400 meters directly below the space station. This maneuver also moves Dragon inside one of two checkpoints around the station that requires a set of go, no-go poles with the different control teams. That first checkpoint is called the approach ellipsoid, or as you might hear it called, the AE. It's an imaginary shape measuring four kilometers by two kilometers by two kilometers, and is essentially a three-dimensional oval. Before Dragon is given permission to move inside that approach ellipsoid, the capsule is configured to be on what is known as a 24-hour safe trajectory, which means that if Dragon lost all control to its thrusters, it would be at least 24 hours before its trajectory would move inside the approach ellipsoid. The NASA and SpaceX teams will do a go-no-go no go pull to move Dragon inside of the keep-out sphere, another checkpoint that consists of an imaginary sphere around the station with a radius of 200 meters. Flight controllers use this to monitor all arriving and departing vehicles. This is another chance to confirm all the guidance, navigation, and control systems are working correctly on Dragon before moving closer to station. It carries a similar requirement on the orbital trajectory that if Dragon were to somehow lose control of its thrusters and it and the space station would be safe for four orbits or about six hours rather than the 24 hours required to enter the approach ellipsoid. Once Dragon arrives at 400 meters below station, it will be at what is known as waypoint zero and will be the first checkpoint during our approach. The vehicle can hold here at 400 meters, but if all of its systems check out, it can continue to the approach, it could continue to approach to waypoint one. Dragon's move from waypoint zero to waypoint one will swing it up and out in front of the space station, arriving at a distance of approximately 220 meters. At this point, it will be on what is called the docking axis, which essentially means it is directly in front of the docking port. The crew are headed to the forward-most port on the space station, which is called the Node 2 forward and is the Earth-facing port. Dragon has docked to Node 2, also known as Harmony, for all the crewed missions so far because that's where both international docking adapters are located and installed for new commercial spacecraft flights as well as any other future spacecraft that use the international docking standard. Once Dragon is only 20 meters away at waypoint two, the spacecraft focuses on aligning its docking system with the international docking adapter. We may hear the call out CHOP, which stands for Crew Hands Off Point, a little less than 30 seconds before docking. At this point, any aborts will have to be done automatically by Dragon. And then it will be the time we have been eagerly anticipating the grand arrival when our crew arrives at the space station. We are targeting that contact at 11.28 a.m. Pacific, P 
p.m. excuse me 11 28 p.m. Pacific and Dragon will fly in and make contact with the IDA giving us what we call soft capture the soft capture ring then retracts until sensors indicate it's time for 12 hooks to drive in place to give us a hard capture and firmly secure Dragon to its new home on the space station from there, the station crew, namely NASA astronaut Jasmine Mokbelli, will manually pressurize the vestibule or the area between the Dragon hatch and the station hatch. Meanwhile, umbilicals that provide power, audio, and data connections from the station to Dragon are put in place. Then it's time for leak checks, hatch opening, which is currently tied timeline to come a little more than two hours following docking. Now, as we continue to count down to docking, let's take a closer look at the Dragon spacecraft that took Crew 8, that is taking Crew 8 to the International Space Station today. The Dragon spacecraft and its trunk stand over 26 feet tall. There are two windows on the spacecraft, plus one under the nose cone. The nose cone opens shortly after launch to expose the forward bulkhead thrusters and docking mechanism that will connect with the space station. Dragon's trunk holds solar cells, which power Dragon while it's in free flight, and the trunk can also carry unpressurized cargo. Dragon has 16 Draco thrusters that can be used in space to help navigate the spacecraft to its destination. Each provides about 90 pounds of force, but that doesn't include the eight Super Draco thrusters used for an abort, which are no longer active once the crew is in orbit. And for those of you following along, you'll know that Dragon, the Dragon spacecraft has played a significant role in advancing our future in space by safely transporting crew to and from the International Space Station. There are currently four Dragon spacecraft supporting human spaceflight missions that have docked to the station. That's Endeavor, Resilience, Endurance, and Freedom. As you saw in the video, Crew-8 are on board Endeavor, which previously flew NASA's SpaceX demo mission two, Crew-2, and Crew-6, in addition to AX-1, the first commercial astronaut mission to the space station. Altogether, the reusable Dragon spacecraft has completed seven human spaceflight missions on behalf of NASA and visited the station 38 times under NASA's commercial resupply and commercial crew programs. Over the last 23 years, crews aboard the space station have completed thousands of scientific and educational experiments, and Crew 8 is prepared to add is prepared to add to that growing number. Crew 8 will conduct hundreds of science experiments and technology demonstrations during their mission. They will spend several months working in our orbital laboratory. Having more crew members on board significantly expands the amount of research that can be conducted. This crew will conduct new scientific research to prepare for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit and benefit humanity on Earth. Experiments include stem cells to create organoid models to study degenerative diseases, studying the effects of microgravity and UV radiation on plants at a cellular level, and testing whether wearing pressure cuffs on the legs could prevent fluid shifts and reduce health problems in astronauts. These are just a few of the more than 200 scientific experiments and technology demonstrations taking place during Crew 8's mission. During their mission, the crew will perform dozens of investigations sponsored by the ISS National Laboratory. These projects span a wide range of disciplines from life and physical sciences to advanced materials, technology development, in-space production applications, and even student-led research. Results from these studies will bring value to humanity, furthering our ability to explore and enabling a robust market in low Earth orbit. So again, we are really looking forward to docking, but let's talk a little bit more about some of the science that is flying on board. So one of those is a human brain organoid model for neurodegenerative disease and drug discovery called H-Bond, and it studies the mechanisms behind neuroinflammation, which is a common feature of neurodegenerative disorders. Researchers create organoids using patent-derived IPSCs, which are induced pluripotent stem cells from patients who have Parkinson's disease and primary progressive multiple sclerosis. The sixth space station organoid investigation funded by the National Stem Cell Foundation, HBON, includes for the first time Alzheimer's IPSCs and testing of the effects of drugs in development to treat neuroinflammation. 
Results could help improve diagnostics, provide insights into the effects of aging, accelerate drug discovery, and even identify therapeutic targets for patients suffering from neurogenitive diseases. The organoid models also could provide a way to anticipate how extended space flight affects the brain and supportive development of countermeasures. Another experiment that is flying includes plants, and we do have a variety of plant experiments that fly and are being grown at any given time on the International Space Station, for example, tomatoes. Uh, but another one that's flying is, a, and sometimes even the plants can be used for food, which is exciting, and the crew always looks forward to having fresh food on board the International Space Station. But the study on plant responses against the stresses of microgravity and high ultraviolet radiation in space, or plant UVB, examines how stress from microgravity, UV radiation, and the combination of the two affect plants at the molecular, cellular, and whole organism levels. Results could increase understanding of plant growth in space and support improvements in plant cultivation technologies for future missions. And this is really important, especially as we journey out to the moon, Mars, and beyond. And in order for us to be successful, we really would like to have the opportunity to grow plants on those missions. So I'm really looking forward to seeing the results from this particular experiment. Another experiment that's flying on board Crew-8 involves weightlessness, weightlessness rather, which cause is fluid shift in the body to move toward the head and can cause changes in eye structure and vision known as space flight association neuro neurocular syndrome or SANS, along with other health problems. Mitigating head wear fluid shifts from venoconstructive thigh cuffs during space flight, or thigh cuff, thigh cuff for short, examines whether thigh pressure cuffs could provide a simple way to counter this shift in body fluids and help protect astronauts from SANS and other issues on future missions to the moon and Mars. Thigh cuffs could also help treat or prevent problems for patients on Earth who have conditions that cause fluid accumulation in the head, such as long-term bed rest and other diseases. So we'll continue to highlight more of the science that is flying on Crew-8 throughout the rest of the broadcast. But again, we are really looking forward to all of this great science that is flying. Uh, in all, there's more than 200 science experiments flying on board Crew-8. So we are coming up on a couple more milestones here as we uh, track towards docking. Uh, again, everything is continuing to go really smoothly. Um, Crew 8 is on their way to the International Space Station. As we mentioned before, there are three first-time flyers on board this mission, as well as one veteran NASA astronaut, Michael Barrett. And so here soon we should be able to see our first views of the Dragon from the International Space Station as it continues to... SpaceX, we have in the CDR speed contract. I have you loud and clear, help me. The same. We are getting some comms from the core to the crew. They are working to set up the big loop, which is a integrated communications loop between the International Space Station here in Hawthorne, as well as Mission Control in Houston. So they'll get that set up so that everyone can communicate on, on the same loop. So they're working through that procedure right now. So at this time, Crew 8 is about 3,250 meters away from the International Space Station. We will continue to see that number get smaller and smaller, of course, throughout um, our show tonight and as we lead up to docking. Yes, and if you are just now joining us, we have had a few burns already um, with Dragon making its way to the International Space Station. We've completed the phase burn, the boost burn, close burn, transfer burn, and the co-elliptic burn, as well as the approach initiation burn. Um, so we are getting closer and closer as Dragon approaches the International Space Station with Crew-8, again, with three members flying in space for the first time and one veteran crew member on board. Um, and we're just about a little over an hour, or a little under an hour and 10 minutes away from that expected contact time with the International Space Station. 
And on board the International Space Station, there are currently seven astronauts and cosmonauts that are living and working as part of Expedition 70. Crew 7 arrived last August, and they return next week, so we'll be covering that on NASA.gov for the latest updates for their return. But Crew 7 includes NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, ESA, or European Space Agency astronaut Andy Mogensen, who is also the current space station commander, as well as JAXA, or Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Satoshi Furukawa, and Konstantin Borisov of Roscosmos. And also on board Space Station is the crew of Soyuz, which launched in September of last year as well. That includes NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara, who will return to Earth at the end of this month, and Conan Yeko and Chubb, who are completing a year-long mission and will return later this fall. And soon, NASA astronaut Tracy Dyson will be launching to the International Space Station as well, aboard a Soyuz spacecraft that's currently scheduled for March 21st. And once Crew 8 docks to the International Space Station, for the next several days, 11 humans will be living and working on the space station as Crew 7 and Crew 8 conduct a handover period. The Crew 7 astronauts will bring the new arrivals. Dragon SpaceX, for awareness, the upcoming approach initiation mid-course burn is in the middle of a Tetris gap that will last for approximately uh, 10 minutes. We will give you the status for that burn after we return at 6.32. Tagging copies and uh, safe status, uh, Big Loop troubleshooting. Big Loop troubleshooting is still ongoing. Um, we're trying some additional power cycles of equipment on the ISS side. Um, we do have a plan to use the contingency big loop um, if that becomes necessary, but I will brief you on that once we have uh, more troubleshooting steps completed. Dragon. That was the core here in Hawthorne speaking to the crew, giving them an update that we will be coming up on a mid-course burn, uh, which we will not have um, uh, communications with during that burn. So they will confirm the burn after it is complete and once we have connectivity once again. Uh, again, the Crew 7 astronauts will bring the new arrivals up to speed on everything happening aboard the space station, from emergency procedures to ongoing research. When NASA and SpaceX teams determine whether it is ideal for a splashdown, the members of Crew 7 will board Dragon Endeavor, which brought them to the space station almost six months ago, and bring them back to Earth. And as you were saying, soon Crew 7, which uh, arrived back in August uh, after spending six months in uh, space, is going to return back to planet Earth. So we're looking forward to that. Of course, you can watch everything from Crew 7 departure to the deorbit burn and splashdown live. And we'll be updating those times on our social media as well as on blogs.nasa.gov. So while we wait for our next milestone, let's take a moment to meet our crew. First up is Commander Matthew Dominic, who hails from Wheat Ridge, Colorado, and is married to Faith Dominic and has two daughters. Matthew earned a Master of Science in Systems Engineering from the Naval Postgraduate School, and he was designated as a Naval Aviator in 2007 and reported to Strike Fighter Squadron 106. He made two deployments to the North Arabian Sea, flying close air support missions in support of Operation Enduring Freedom, and he has accumulated more than 1,600 flight hours in 28 aircraft models, 400 career arrestments, and 61 combat missions. In 2015, he was awarded Naval Test Wing Atlantic Test Pilot of the Year, and this is his very first space flight. Dr. Michael R. Barrett. Crew 8 pilot was selected by NASA in 2000. Board certified in internal and aerospace medicine, he participated in two space flights, Expedition 19 and 20 in 2009, and STS-133 in 2011, during which he spent a total of 212 days in space. He received his Doctor of Medicine from Northwestern University and completed his residency and master's program in aerospace medicine at Wright State University. 
In 2011, he was awarded the prestigious Hubertus Strughold Award for con contributions to space medicine research. Michael lives in League City, Texas with his wife, Michelle, and their five children. And this is mission specialist Jeanette Epps, and it's her first space flight. She's also a NASA astronaut. The New York native was a NASA fellow during graduate school and worked for Ford Motor Company, where she received a U.S. patent for her research. After leaving Ford, she joined the Central Intelligence Agency, yes, the CIA, for seven years working as a technical intelligence officer before becoming an astronaut in 2009. Dr. Epps served as a representative to the generic joint operation panel working on crew efficiency on the space station, and she was a crew support astronaut for two expeditions and served as lead CAPCOM or capsule communicator in Mission Control Houston. Dr. Epps was inducted into the University of Maryland Department of Aerospace Engineering Academy of Distinguished Alumni in 2012. And another first-time flyer, mission specialist Alexander Grabenkin earned a technical diploma in technical operation of transport radio electronics from the Irkutska Military Aerospace Engineering Institute in 2002. He also has an engineering degree in radio communications, broadcasting, and television. In 2018, he was accepted in the Cosmonaut Corps and began general space training at the Yuri Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center. And so the next milestone that we're tracking is the mid-course maneuver burn. Uh, it's going to happen a little less than two minutes from now. And this is really a fine-tuning burn uh, that's going to just ensure that Dragon is continuing to get in the right spot ahead of docking. So we are tracking that here coming up pretty soon. And this is an automated burn. Dragon's computer determines if the mid-course burn is required. happens about 25 minutes after the AI burn. Again, it's, a, it's really just a fine-tuning maneuver. It could be small, it could be a little bit more sp uh, significant, but it fine-tunes the approach to waypoint zero because that swing from AI to waypoint zero is pretty big, so this is a chance for a fine-tuned maneuver ahead of that. And then following that mid-course burn, we are expecting reaching waypoint zero around 10.47 p.m. Uh, Pacific time tonight. Um, and once we get through waypoint zero, the vehicle can continue um, to waypoint two um, and then eventually contact the International Space Station, expected at 11.28 p.m. Pacific time. And as Dragon works to catch up to the International Space Station, it is currently flying 267 statute miles over the Indian Ocean. We are hearing that that burn has begun. So again, Dragon, I have you loud and clear. We have resolved our comm issues on the big loop. Uh, please perform a comm check with Houston and station as well. Happy. Hey, Shouldn't it? Dragon on the big loop. How do you read? Dragon Station, we have you loud and clear. Welcome. Great to hear your voice, Jasmine. Houston, Dragon, how do you read on the big loop? Hey, Bajo, got you loud and clear here in Houston. How me? Loud and clear, Neil. So we did hear good confirmation that the big loop is configured. We heard a couple of different voices on the big loop um, during that communication. First up, we heard uh, the core here in Hawthorne, uh, and he was letting the crew of Crew 8 know that the big loop was properly configured, but to go ahead and do a voice check with both the International Space Station and then the ground in Mission Control. So the commander of Crew 8, Matthew Dominic, called to the International Space Station, and we heard NASA astronaut Jasmine Mugbelli, who's going to continue to help with with uh, docking preparations once the crew is docked this evening, say that they 
heard them loud and clear, which is great news. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Mid-course correction maneuver is complete and nominal. Trajectory is converged on waypoint zero. Dragon copies on the big loop. And good news that that uh, burn was successful. Everything continuing to uh, tick along properly. Um, and just to continue what I was saying about the uh, big loop there, following the call to the International Space Station, they called to Mission Control Houston, and we heard NASA astronaut Raja Chari, uh, who is serving as the Capcom. And if you watched launch last night, he was actually on the broadcast, so he has certainly been busy uh, <laughs> working hard. So again, we had a great burn. Everything is going really smoothly so far. We recently got to ask the Crew 8 astronauts why they believe human spaceflight is so important. copies. And so we did hear a call out about some exercise constraints for the crew on board the International Space Station. This is just a safety precaution so that no loads are imparted on the International Space Station. The crew does have to exercise for several hours a day um, to keep their bone and muscle health uh, strong in the microgravity environment of the International Space Station. Uh, they have a variety of ways in which they can exercise on board, including a treadmill. They have a weightlifting machine and they also have a station bike. And Commander Andy Mogensen from ESA has actually been working on a really exciting experiment throughout uh, this increment where he wears a VR headset while he pedals on the stationary bike. And he's talked about it in interviews, how it really makes a difference and kind of feels like you are back on Earth instead of maybe just looking at a wall or something while you're uh, pedaling on the stationary bike. So I'm excited to see if they'll continue to do that for future crews. Yeah. That sounds like a pretty amazing way to exercise while you're out in space and maybe even be able to take you to different parts of the world. Um, so we're actually going to check in with Anna Schneider in Houston and see what's happening with the latest on their side of the house. Anna. Good morning and welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. We are gearing up for this morning's docking and looking forward to having Crew 8 on board station here soon. But before the crew can come aboard, Endeavour will complete its docking and hatch opening operations. NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli will be in the station's cupola using special software to track, track Dragon's approach and making sure it stays in the expected zones. Once Dragon is docked, Mogbelli will be primed to start hatch opening operations. She'll start by opening a large hatch on node 24 to give her access to the pressurized mating adapter. The crew will then have to pressurize the vestibule, which is a small space between the hatches on the Dragon and the space station. This area was exposed to vacuum prior to docking, so the crew will need to fill it with air and make sure the pressure is nearly equal with atmospheric pressure on Dragon and the station. Mogbelli
belly will use a small valve on the station's hatch to slowly introduce air into the station's vestibule, and flight controllers here in Houston will monitor and verify the pressure readings to make sure everything is leak-free before we open up the hatches. NASA Flight Director Paul Kanya is leading teams here in Mission Control Houston for Dragon's approach and docking, and to their right is CAPCOM or Capsule Communicator Neil Nagata, who will be communicating with the crew aboard station. Right now, there are seven astronauts aboard the space station, and that number will jump to 11 once crew eight astronauts arrive on board. Again, we're excited to get our crew eight astronauts aboard to work on handover with the crew seven astronauts, and that's the latest here from Mission Control Houston. Back over to Hawthorne. Thanks, Anna. So glad to hear that everything is continuing smoothly from the International Space Station side. And we are looking forward to that docking coming up at 1128 p.m. Pacific time this evening. So the crew on board the International Space Station is currently in their post-sleep period. Uh, but following that, they're going to jump right into uh, those docking preparations that Anna was telling us about. Uh, Jasmine Mongbelli is going to be prime for all of that vestibule work that uh, Anna just talked through. Um, so we should be uh, seeing her start to get some tools set up and, and really prepare for Dragon's approach and docking. We are about 10 minutes away from the next milestone uh, coming up, uh, which will be waypoint zero. And that's when the vehicle is getting closer and closer to the space station. And there's a few. Station Houston, expect to start monitoring Dragon in approximately 35 minutes. Copy, 35 minutes. And a call out there letting the space station know that Dragon will be arriving in just uh, very shortly and they should be able to monitor Dragon in about 35 minutes from now. Yeah, we are less than an hour from that scheduled docking at 11.28 p.m. Pacific. Uh, as of this second, Dragon uh, is about 756 meters away from the International Space Station. And so when Crew 8 arrives, um, like we mentioned earlier, there are three first-time flyers on board. To date, there's been 276 visitors to the International Space Station from 22 countries. So those three first-time flyers will mark 277, 278, and 279 people to the International Space Station. And another uh, fun fact, point of reference, is that uh, Jeanette Epps, this is her very first space flight. Uh, she will be the 76th woman to fly to space. And uh, if you didn't know, it is International Women's History Month. Uh, so exciting for Jeanette to check that off during this month, especially. And you can see on your screen a pretty incredible view. This is Dragon looking at the International Space Station, which is where it will be docked for about the next six months. So very exciting. You could tell that we're getting closer and closer as the view there is uh, very visible in, uh, from the Dragon spacecraft. That's right, and the International Space Station is currently flying 268 statute miles over the South Pacific Ocean. But yeah, we'll continue to see the International Space Station come into better and better view. You can see some of the solar arrays and some of the, the modules, but again, I'm looking forward to seeing it come into more detail and us sharing a, a bit more about what you're seeing on your screen. And you can 
see if you squint uh, between the clouds <laughs> there, that little white dot, that is Dragon with Crew 8 on board. Uh, we'll, again, continue to see this grow larger, but great to see those very first views of Crew 8 and Endeavor. So it does take a lot of work to get to this point to make sure we were launching Dragon and this new crew. Oh, and there's an even better view. You can <laughs> see the nose cone is open there. That nose cone did open uh, shortly after launch and it, it stays open all the way through docking. It exposes that guidance, navigation and control systems. And that's actually where the crew uh, will enter into the International Space Station once we get docked and have the vestibule um, repressurized and all those checkouts go smoothly. So there are two flashing lights on board Dragon. There's a green one and there is a red one um, and they signal the starboard and port side of the vehicle. Uh, this is taken from uh, airplanes, you will see those. They have those to help distinguish as well. And it looks like we just lost our view, but we will regain it here shortly. Um, we have brief handover periods between the tracking and data relay system. And again, now we're getting a view of the International Space Station again from Endeavour. So to talk a little bit more about all the hard work that it takes to get to this point, um, to the fully functioning orbital laboratory, which you see on board your screen there, most of the crew uh, is in their post-sleep period like we talked about. They woke up just as we joined the broadcast. And after post-sleep, the crew got is getting into those uh, preparations for Dragon arrival. Like we've mentioned a couple times, Jasmine Mugbelly will be in the station's cupola. She'll use that special software to track Dragon's approach and make sure it's staying in the expected zones. Once Dragon is docked, Mugbelly will be primed to move right into hatch operation, operations. Rather, She will start by opening the large hatch at node two forward, giving her access inside the pressurized mating adapter. The crew will then work to pressurize the vestibule, which is the small space between the hatches on Dragon and the International Space Station. Because this was exposed to vacuum prior to docking, the crew needs to fill it up with air and make sure its pressure is nearly equal with the atmospheric pressure on Dragon and the space station before the crew can come on board. Mogbelli will do this by using a small valve on the station's hatch to slowly introduce air into the vestibule. And flight controllers in Houston will monitor the pressure and temperature readings inside to verify that everything is leak free before we get ready to open up the hatches. And of course, preparation began prior to crew arrival to make sure that they do have somewhere to stay since we'll have a full house of 11 for a few days before Crew 7 departs. So Space Station Commander Andy Mogensen from the European Space Agency moved out of his crew quarters and into a CASA unit, basically a temporary campout space. Meanwhile, JAXA, or Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Satoshi Furukawa also moved into, into a temporary space, and he'll be staying in the Japanese Experiment Module, or the GEM. So we are very excited to get those four new, ast well, three new astronauts, uh, but four uh, astronauts in total aboard and bring Se Expedition 70 up to an 11 crew for handover. Right now, the Expedition 70 crew aboard the station is awake and preparing for Dragon's approach. Right now, there are seven astronauts and cosmonauts aboard the station. Crew on board Dragon is prime for, is prime for approach monitoring. Crew on station can follow along, but they're not required to for any abort commanding monitoring. Once docked, the International Space Station crew will be prime for setting up the hardware on the station side to get ready for hatch opening and pre-positioning some ducting that will be used to integrate Dragon's atmosphere with the rest of the station. So a lot of work has already been done and the station team remains ready for Dragon to arrive in just under an hour from now. And it looks like we got both of those views now looking side by side next to each other. Again, on your left-hand screen, a view from the International Space Station looking at Dragon Endeavor, while the right-hand view is a view from Dragon Endeavor looking at the International Space Station. And Endeavour is now less than 470 meters from the International Space Station. We're just a few minutes away from we reaching waypoint zero. 
Waypoint Zero is 400 meters below the space station, and this is one of the first checkpoints where the vehicle can hold or continue if all of its systems check out. And if for some reason in the very highly unlikely situation where we were to lose control of Dragon, it would be at least four out orbits and about six hours uh, before it would move inside the keep out sphere, which would allow the team on the ground to work that issue. But again, we are not tracking anything like that. We are not expecting anything uh, like that this evening, but we are coming up on uh, that 400 meters below space station here in, in just a couple minutes. And this is actually a very great view to kind of describe where Dragon is relative to the International Space Station. You can see Earth in the background, so you can see that Dragon is below the space station. Uh, once it reaches waypoint zero, it'll be 400 meters below the space station, but moving into waypoint one, it will actually be swinging up and in front of the space station. So you won't be able to see Earth behind it anymore because it'll be in front of the space station. And those views are just really awesome of Earth in the background. I know, it really is. Uh, the space station is flying 265 statute miles over the Tasman Sea off the uh, east coast of New Zealand. They are traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, which means that they see a sunset every 45 minutes and a sunrise every 45 minutes, uh, which if you do the math, it uh, means they are circling the Earth every 90 minutes. SpaceX Dragon, Dragon to ground, section uh, 5.1 complete for uh, 4.010. And uh, successful intercom checks. Copy, Mike, successful intercom checks. Uh, for awareness on timeline, we will have you step into suit leak check after the approach zero burn is complete. Copy, suit lead checks after uh, approach zero. And so Endeavour is now 435 meters from the International Space Station, closing in on waypoint zero. You do hear some communications um, from the ground up to the crew just to let them know they're going to wait for uh, this burn to complete before they begin those suit leak checks. Uh, the crew is in those spacesuits and will remain in them uh, through docking, but uh, first they're going to complete some leak checks just to make sure that everything is as it should be. Um, in case there were a depressurization scenario, the crew would be be able to uh, be A-OK -okay in those spacesuits. And again, as we approach uh, these different checkpoints, waypoint zero, waypoint one, waypoint two, they're actually just checkpoints. Uh, the vehicle will be monitoring its position, and if it if everything checks out, it can, can it can just continue to make its way to the next Space checkpoint. Space Dragon, Dragon to ground, uh, complete with 4.010. Copy, suit downing procedure complete. And we are less than one minute until waypoint zero. And Dragon, with that, I would like to bring cameras back on board. SpaceX Dragon, uh, you are good to come on board. Welcome. And with that, we do expect to get our first views on board Endeavour here shortly. The suit's primary function is to protect the crew in the event of a cabin depressurization. If that were to occur, the suit would inflate and provide a habitable environment long enough for the crew to return home. The flame-resistant materials on the outer layer also protect the crew in the event of a fire. And these are custom-tailored suits to each one of these astronauts. They are a single-piece suit. This means that the helmet, gloves, and boots all remain attached. 
The helmet is actually made of 3D printed nylon and has a visor that pivots open, which you may see uh, when we see the crew uh, when they open and close their visors. The quick disconnect or QD on the right thigh mates to an umbilical on the seat. This is what provides the air ventilation, oxygen, nitrox for pressurization, and allows the electronics to be connected all from a single location on the suit. A tubing network inside of the suit also delivers air to the neck and limbs to keep the crew cool while wearing the suit because it is, you know, covering them, probably uh, keeping them a bit warm. So the air flowing through helps keep them cool. The suit's communication system consists of helmet... Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Approach zero is in progress and trajectory has converged on waypoint zero. Arrival at waypoint zero at approximately 1711. And with that, you are good to proceed into 4.011 for leak checks. I can copy. Definite 4.011, see leak check. And good calls there. They have confirmed that we have made it to waypoint zero and that the crew is good to perform their leak, their suit leak checks um, inside of the cabin there. And Crew 8 has passed through waypoint zero, which is that 400 meter uh, checkpoint below space station right now. It looks like they're about 381 meters away from the International Space Station. So as we begin to move closer to waypoint one, which is our next milestone, a couple of things are going to happen. Uh, the sensors on Dragon are going to work to basically get a lock on the docking port that it's targeting. And uh, once they do eventually dock, that uh, soft capture ring will uh, automatically capture uh, the docking port, and then we will uh, work to close those Thanks latches. Dragon on the big group, ready to pressurize. Dragon SpaceX, you are. Dragon SpaceX, you are go to initiate suit leak checks. And there you heard some comms that they are beginning their suit leak checks. Again, they do put their suits on during the dynamic events of docking. So they are doing some suit leak checks to make sure everything is working properly with their suits before they dock to the International Space Station. Uh, so they are pressurizing those suits right now inside of Dragon. Uh, they'll do this leak check um, and then make sure that everything is good, and if so, then they can um, proceed towards docking to the International Space Station. And speaking of these suits, these are intravehicular activity suits or IVA suits, and they're designed for use inside of Dragon. So when the astronauts move onto the International Space Station, the suits will stay on board Dragon. They will no longer need them inside of the International Space Station. The astronauts will then use NASA's extravehicular activity or EVA suits when they need to go outside of the International Space Station. Those are actually designed for the purpose of being outside and in space versus our EVA, IVA suits are made for uh, solely internally inside of Dragon. And speaking of EVAs or spacewalks, you're getting a view at the top of your screen there of the Canada Arm 2. Um, that is a tool that is sometimes used during spacewalks to maneuver crew members to different parts of the International Space Station. It can also be used to help move payloads around and place different science experiments on the external portion of the International Space Station. 
And now, as we mentioned earlier, you can see a little bit difference of view. You no longer see Earth in the background, and that is because Dragon is moving and swinging itself up and in front of the International Space Station. And we are uh, about to enter an orbital uh, nighttime as well, so uh, we might see a little more darkness than we did before. But getting some great views of Endeavor. Again, you can see that nose cone, which is open. It was open shortly after launch, and again, will remain open all the way through docking um, up until the point that Crew 8 comes home, at which point it is closed to help uh, protect all of that guidance and navigation equipment as the crew re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. Copy, we see the same. And we are hearing that there were four good leak checks on board uh, Crew Dragon Endeavor. So another milestone as we continue to press towards docking at 11.28 p.m. Pacific time this evening. Sandra, you mentioned orbital nighttime. Uh, once we get to waypoint two, everything is pretty much automated, um, but sometimes you get a little bit more light than you would like on uh, the docking adapter. Um, and so Dragon will actually pause uh, approximately 220 meters uh, away from, or excuse me, 20 meters away from the International Space Station, make sure that it can actually see uh, and be, uh, confirm that it's fully aligned with the International Space Station before it begins that docking procedure. And we are about 15 minutes away from waypoint one. Uh, Dragon is 354 meters away from the space station. And so we were talking a little bit about the orbital daytime and nighttime. Um, so I know sometimes back on Earth, it can be a little confusing with all the different time zones across the world, but on board the International Space Station, they use GMT, which is Greenwich Mean Time. Um, and that helps everyone stay on the same time across the world. Everyone's tracking that same time zone. And you can see that Dragon kind of drifted off the screen there. It's a good reminder that the vehicles, both the International Space Station and Dragon, are moving very quickly, uh, even though it does look like they're moving very slow relative to each other. Um, and as Dragon approaches and gets closer and closer, um, we have to continue to adjust the camera to keep the Dragon or the International Space Station in sight of each other. Now just about 30 minutes, 31 minutes or so away from docking at 11.28 p.m. Pacific time this evening. We talked about some of the science that the crew is going to be doing on board the International Space Station, over 200 science experiments, uh, but they also are expected to see a couple of really exciting visitors during their mission. Uh, that is the Boeing uh, crewed flight test this spring, where NASA astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams uh, will spend a week or so on board the International Space Station targeted for April, where they will complete a test checkout flight of their Boeing vehicle.
And what you're seeing on your screen is our mission controls here at SpaceX as, as well as NASA. And SpaceX mission control is based in our headquarters in Hawthorne, California. From here, our teams are monitoring Dragon and checking in on all of its systems. To help make sure that the crew has a safe journey, our team in mission control will be monitoring, or is currently monitoring the progress all along the way. Now on console or headset are six key positions who are monitoring the health of the vehicle and the crew. The mission director responsible for mission success is in charge in the room. The person that you've been hearing talking to the astronauts is the crew operations and resources engineer, or you may have heard us refer to them as the core. The other positions are also focused on vehicle systems like navigation and control, avionics, software, propulsion, life support, and communications with ground segments. And back in Mission Control Houston, uh, that Mission Control Center is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Team members there are trained in a variety of disciplines and monitor all of space station systems. Just like Mission Control in Hawthorne, we have someone dedicated to talk to the crew members to streamline communications. This keeps the astronauts from needing multiple conversations on different subjects. This role is called the CAPCOM, which stands for Capsule Communicator. However, this person isn't talking with the capsule like the name might suggest. Uh, that's SpaceX's core, but the, the CAPCOM is speaking with the astronauts already living aboard the International Space Station. The Capcom sits right next to the flight director, and the flight director gathers information and data from all flight controllers and leads the team through major milestones. They approve or decline suggestions based on pre-established flight rules as well. And tonight's flight director is Paul Kanye. Another key member uh, of the team inside Mission Control Houston is the ADCO, who controls the attitude or orientation of the space station. We also have the VVO, which is the visiting vehicle officer, who monitors and works with external teams sending spacecraft to and from the International Space Station. There's also a flight surgeon who the astronauts get a chance to speak with on a regular schedule on a private conference line. If you were listening in a little bit earlier in the broadcast, you actually did hear that call out about uh, having a quick medical check with the flight surgeon. Uh, so that happens regularly on the flight uphill as well as on board the International Space Station during their increment. Another console position that we have is Robo, who works with the Canada Arm 2 to maneuver it to complete work outside the space station. When astronauts are in a spacewalk, the Canada Arm 2 can be maneuvered by an astronaut within the space station to move them around the International Space Station. There are many other positions and team members who monitor the station's solar arrays, the astronaut schedules, and even where every single piece of equipment and cargo is stored. So it takes a tough and competent team to make a mission successful. And as you see on your screen there, though, that is just uh, the crew that, or rather the mission control team that is working uh, this Crew 8 Dragon docking. But again, Mission Control Houston is staffed 24-7, 365. And it's pretty incredible to see the teams working together and how smooth this all goes. I know that there's a, there's a lot going on in both mission controls, um, but from launch uh, while Dragon is in orbit, mission control in space, at SpaceX in Hawthorne, California is communicating with the crew. And then there's this tandem period, which is what we're currently in right now. And both mission controls are working with the crew on Dragon as well as the International Space Station. Once the crew docks to the International Space Station, that will be handed over to NASA's Mission Control Houston. Um, so just great teamwork all around and really incredible to see how so many people can work together and collaborate to make something like this happen. Yeah, that's exactly right. And we actually call this time period that we're in right now integrated operations uh, when Hawthorne and Mission Control Houston are really integrated working together through uh, these dynamic phases of flight. Um, and I did hear that the ISS team um, back in Mission Control Houston did pull go to proceed through waypoint one and through waypoint two. Endeavor is closing in on 300 meters away from the International Space Station.
We are just about 25 minutes from the expected contact time of 11.28 p.m. Pacific time. So many of you may be familiar with the idea of a mission patch, but maybe you don't know how they came to exist. For decades, crew members have worked together to develop the patch for their mission, determining which aspects of the mission they want to highlight and any special details they'd like to include. The crew themselves can design their patch or they can share their design ideas with an artist who makes it come to life. NASA's SpaceX Crew-8 mission uh, will maintain a continuous human research presence in low Earth orbit. In their patch, the crew is represented by the never-ending path of a Latin numeral eight, with the dragon bowing with respect to its destination, the International Space Station, uh, which they will arrive at here at 11.28 p.m. Pacific time this evening. I really love the patches for these missions, and I love that the crew has the ability to put their you know, own personal touch uh, on those patches because it's such a meaningful, uh, symbolic um, representation of their mission. Um, so really cool to see what Crew 8 came up with and uh, love the design. Also, a, another unique part of our crew launches is the zero-G indicators, um, and love that uh, we got some really good words from the crew, uh, from the commander once they made it to space and the zero-G indicator was uh, released. It was actually a stuffed uh, dog that was chosen by uh, his daughter um, and represented you know, parents, you know, constantly working very hard um, and going out in the world to essentially change the world and their kids, you know, being their support system. And I thought that was like, I, I love that story behind that. And so it's just another thing where they can put their personal touch and uh, have something very personal with them uh, on board Crew Dragon. Yeah, that was a very special sentiment. Uh, great to hear that from the commander, uh, Matthew Dominic, who this is his very first space flight. Um, and if you are just tuning in, we have uh, just about less than 30 minutes now until uh, Dragon is expected to dock with the International Space Station following their launch from the Kennedy Space Center last night at 10.53 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, Dragon is now 280 meters away from the International Space Station, and we are coming up on Waypoint 1 in a couple of minutes from now. That waypoint one uh, milestone will move Dragon in front of the station, approximately 220 meters away, and moves it directly in front of its docking port. Uh, for this particular mission, Dragon is docking to the node two forward port. There's also a node two zenith port. And uh, the distinction between those two, node two forward is actually facing towards the earth, whereas node to Zenith is facing um, towards space. And you might also hear node two referred to as harmony. They're the, they're the same thing. And yeah, so as you can see in this graphic here, uh, Dragon is working to swing its way up and be directly in front of that docking port. That puts us right in line with the docking access. And once Dragon reaches that docking axis. It has about 20 hours of power, so it could hold there if needed for quite some time and could reattempt to dock if necessary, but everything is proceeding well and on track for docking today at 11.28 p.m. Pacific. Along the way, Dragon Endeavor will, has made some stops at some various points upon approach. These different waypoints allow teams to evaluate the status of the vehicle and the readiness of the space station to receive it. These checkpoints include outside the keepout sphere and the approach ellipsoid, which are two invisible boundaries around the station. Both of these boundaries are monitored for all visiting vehicles, whether crew or cargo. 
Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. Approach 1 and soft capture ring extension will begin shortly. Dragon will continue approach to waypoint 2. Dragon copies on the big loop. And as we continue to make our approach from waypoint one to waypoint two and make our final approach, a couple of things uh, will happen that you might hear over. Oh, and here we are getting our very first views inside of the Dragon Endeavor. Uh, the crew there is suited up, as you can see. They're just continuing to monitor um, the screens on board Dragon. This is an automated process, but the crew can uh, take over if needed up to a point uh, uh, right before docking called CHOP. You'll hear that called out, and that's the crew hands-off period. Um, and from that point on, it is a fully automated docking. And it may be hard to tell what's on your screen, but right now this is a view from Dragon looking at the space station as it is making its way to waypoint two. Again, that will align Dragon with the docking adapter on the space station. And, and it looks like we are getting a space <laughs> selfie. <laughs> you gotta capture the moment. That wow, is excellent. Wow, how special. <laughs> Even astronauts take selfies. <laughs> Dragon is about 236 meters away from the International Space Station currently. And the International Space Station is currently flying 259 statute miles, um, about to cross, it's in the North Pacific Ocean right now, flying across the North Pacific Ocean, but here in just a few minutes, it's actually going to cross over uh, California and fly right overhead in San Francisco. So if you are in San Francisco um, and you do not have the Spot the Station app downloaded, you might have just enough time to download it and head outside and uh, be able to look at where the International Space Station is flying overhead. Looks like uh, drag, uh, the space station is going to make a pass across Nevada and up across uh, the northern United States. So if you are in any of those uh, further places along the track, you might be able to look up and see it. We did just release a new uh, Spot the Station app at the end of last year uh, that improved some of the tracking on that application. So um, really special to see the International Space Station fly overhead. If you haven't, I strongly encourage you all to download that, that app. Again, what you're seeing on your screen is a view from the International Space Station looking at Dragon, and it's looking at basically the forward hatch with the nose cone deployed, exposing the four, four forward bulkhead thrusters that are on Dragon. Station Houston on the big loop. Monitor Dragon Approach for step three of 1.102 Dragon Approach and Retreat Monitoring. Let us know when your review is complete and you are ready for docking. Houston Station copies, we'll come. And that was the voice of NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, who is going to be prime for uh, docking operations to help pressurize the vestibule, get everything ready to go before the hatches can be opened uh, once Dragon docks. We're now less than 20 minutes away from docking, continuing to get views inside Dragon Endeavor. On the left of your screen is the commander of Endeavor, Matthew Dominic. It's his very first space flight, and to his right is Mike Barrett, uh, who is a veteran NASA astronaut. There's also uh, two more individuals inside the capsule, uh, one on the uh, far left who we can't see right now, but that is NASA astronaut Jeanette Epps, who this is also her first time space flight. And then on the right of the screen, which again, we don't have a view of them right now, but uh, that is Roscosmos cosmonaut um, Konstantin Borisov. Houston Station, ready for docking.
He's in copies. And we did just hear from NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli on board the International Space Station that from their end, everything is ready to go. They're ready for Dragon to dock. We are still targeting an 1128 p.m. Pacific time docking this evening. And the station Houston on the big loop, um, at waypoint two, Dragon will briefly pause to align for docking and then automatically resume the approach. Station copies. Just some good comms there. Just a reminder that when Dragon reaches waypoint two, it will pause to align with the docking system, but then we'll continue to move forward with approaching the International Space Station. And so at this time, we are within that keep out sphere, which is a 200 meter radius. It's an invisible line around the International Space Station. Um, this uh, keep out sphere means that if something were to happen with Dragon, uh, there would be a four orbit safe while outside of that. But again, everything's continuing to go really smoothly. Uh, the next major milestone that we'll um, see is about 20 meters from the space station when we'll arrive at waypoint two. And at this point, Dragon will focus on aligning its docking system with the IDA on the uh, space station's commanded attitude. And once we get to waypoint two, it's usually about a five minute um, period before we have contact and capture. So coming up on waypoint two arrival here shortly. And the view that you're seeing on your screen is a view inside of Dragon Endeavor with the commander on the left-hand side, pilot on your right-hand side, and they're just monitoring those displays there. Again, Dragon is an autonomous vehicle. They do have the ability to take over manual control if necessary, um, but you may hear a call out for CHOP. That is the crew hands-off period, um, and that's when the Dragon must uh, take over and uh, will be, if an abort is necessary, Dragon will have to make that autonomous decision. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. Soft capture ring extension is complete. Thank you, Captain. So we are uh, now almost 100 meters away from the International Space Station. Right now it's looking at about 115 meters. And we are in a orbital nighttime. Um, again, I did mention that the International Space Station was flying across the United States. Right now it is flying across Montana. Uh, just uh, flew overhead Billings and approaching Miles City. Um, and soon it's going to be approaching North Dakota, at which point it will cross into Canada and fly overhead of Ontario, Ontario Canada. Fly overhead of Ontario, Ontario Canada. We did hear a call out that the soft capture ring has been extended. This soft capture ring will help a soft capture to the International Space Station. And once that soft capture is confirmed, then that soft capture ring will retract and then we will have um, hooks for a hard capture to the International Space Station.
So again, that next major milestone that we are uh, tracking ahead towards is waypoint two. That's 20 meters from space station. Continuing to close in now less than 100 meters away, 91 meters, uh, now 90 meters actually. And again, these views inside Endeavour on the left is the commander, um, Matthew Dominic, his very first space flight, and to his right is veteran NASA astronaut uh, Mike Barrett. We're just about three minutes out from uh, waypoint two. And less than 10 minutes until docking at uh, targeted time of 11.28 p.m. Pacific. These are views of Dragon from the International Space Station. You can see some of those lights flashing. And uh, while we are uh, looking forward to docking at 11.28 p.m. Pacific time, just about eight minutes from now. Uh, let's head back over to Mission Control Houston and check in with Anna to see how things are going over there. Thanks. Thanks, Sandra. Right now, the team here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room is actually conducting the go-no-go no go poll for docking. Dragon and then the SpaceX crew aboard the International the Space Station. Oh, excuse me. Houston and Hawthorne have pulled go for docking. Confirm you are ready for approach two. We are sending the approach allowed flag now. We see the approach allowed flag to true, and we're closing visors. Copy visors closed. And one additional reminder, once Dragon is inside the crew hands off, points retreat and breakout are not permitted. And copy is four visors closed. And we just heard confirmation that both the NASA and SpaceX teams have pulled go for docking and the crew aboard Station the Houston Dragon on a big Endeavour loop. spacecraft. Dragon is on final approach and is go for docking. Monitor for steps five and six in one decimal one zero two. Dragon approach and retreat monitoring. Station copy is monitoring for steps five and six of Dragon approach and retreat monitoring. And we just heard good words that NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, who's currently aboard the International Space Station in the station's cupola monitoring docking, is good for docking to proceed. And the space or in the Dragon crew aboard Endeavour has their visors down and are prepared for the final approach and docking in just a few minutes from now. Again, everything is continuing to look good here on the station side. And the voice you heard of NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, who will be in the station's cupola, she'll be using special software to drag track Dragon's approach and ensuring the vehicle stays in the expected zones, and then she will also be primed for hatch opening operations once Dragon is docked. During these operations, she'll start by opening the large hatch on node 2 forward, giving her access into the pressurized mating adapter. The crew will then pressurize the vestibule, which is the small space between the hatches on the Dragon and Space Station. This area was previously exposed to vacuum prior to docking, so the crew will need to fill it with air and ensure that its pressure is e nearly equal to with the atmospheric pressure on both Dragon and Space Station. Mogbelly will use a small valve on the station's hatch to slowly introduce air into the station's vestibule. 
flight controllers here in Houston will monitor and verify the pressure readings to make sure everything is leak free before we get ready to open up the hatches. The entire process will take a couple of hours to complete. We're still on track for a docking in just a few minutes, followed by a hatch opening a couple of hours following that, and then we will round it all out with a welcome ceremony as Crew 8 officially joins the Expedition 70 crew currently aboard the International Space Station. Again, everything continuing to proceed smoothly from here in Mission Control Houston. Back over to Hawthorne. Thanks so much, Anna. Great to hear that everything is uh, going smoothly from the Mission Control Houston side. We are getting a view right now uh, from Node 2 Forward or from Harmony uh, where Dragon is uh, slowly coming in to dock to the International Space Station. Right now, uh, Dragon is about 22 meters away. And so soon we may hear that call out for CHOP, which is crew hands off period. Um, from this point, everything will be automated and uh, the crew will not have to do anything. Um, if there is uh, some type of situation that comes up, uh, Dragon's uh, computers would handle that from that point. Um, so we are just about 20 meters away from capture. And once Dragon does make a soft capture to the International Space Station, there's still a few things that the vehicle needs to do to make sure that it does complete a hard capture. Um, following the soft capture, the soft capture ring will retract until the center sensors indicate that it's time for the hooks to drive in place. And there's two sets of hooks. There will be six to start. Um, followed by another six. And once those hooks are in place, then it can attach uh, its umbilical um, and that will conclude the hard capture for Dragon. So even once uh, Dragon approaches the International Space Station, there are still a, a few events that do need to happen to confirm that hard capture. Meters. Copy, 15 meters. So you did hear that call out that uh, Dragon is now less than 15 meters away from the International Space Station, continuing to close in slowly. We'll hear that call out for CHOP, crew hands off point two meters before contact. now approaching 10 meters away from the International Space Station. meters. Copy, five meters. Should hear the call out for CHOP shortly. that call standing by for contact and capture one meter copy one meter And contact confirm, Dragon made contact with the International Space Station at 11.28 p.m. Pacific while flying central over the North Atlantic uh, Ocean just east of Newfoundland. 
And there are still a few steps to complete before Dragon is securely attached to the station. Again, we do have soft capture, but then we will retract that soft capture ring. Then we can start driving in the uh, hard capture hooks. Again, there will be two sets of six hooks each. Once that those hooks... Uh, ring retraction in progress. There's that call out that the soft capture ring is now being retracted. And then shortly we should hear that the first six hooks will begin to drive in for that hard capture. And so if you are just joining us, we did have crew eight successfully docked to the International Space Station just a minute ago at 11.28 p.m. Pacific time. On board crew eight are four astronauts, and there you can see a view of Endeavour docked to the International Space Station. That's the forward port of Harmony. On board Dragon are three first time flyers and one veteran NASA astronaut. And so Dragon will remain docked to the International Space Station throughout their mission. They are targeting a six month long mission aboard the International Space Station. Now it does take a few minutes for that soft capture ring retraction to complete. And then we'll take another few minutes for hard capture with the 12 hooks that will drive into the International Space Station to hard dock to the International Space Station. So we should expect that soft capture ring retraction completion in just a couple minutes from now. And once soft capture is complete, uh, we will have those hard capture rings you were talking about begin to engage. There's 12 of them in total, but they'll engage in two groups of six. So the first six will engage, and then the other six will engage. And at that point, we'll have a, a successful hard capture docking. There will also be an umbilical that does attach from Dragon to the International Space Station. So while Dragon does have its own internal battery power, while it's docked to the station, it will connect with the International Space Station's power. That's right, and you do see the nose cone, uh, which is open there at the very front of your screen. Um, now that you see it docked, it makes a lot of sense why it needs to be open so that uh, all that guidance and navigation control system can be exposed. But again, this is the hatch that the crew will actually uh, float through once they go aboard the International Space Station as after that ves vestibule is pressurized um, and all those leak checks are completed. Um, so that won't happen right away. It is, it is a bit of a process, um, but we will be providing coverage uh, throughout that, so stick with us and then you'll be able to see the crew float aboard the International Space Station for the first time. Another thing to point out here is that on the back end of Dragon is the trunk that's still attached uh, that will remain attached throughout the duration of the uh, time that Crew 8 is aboard the International Space Station. That is... Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Ring retraction is complete. Docking sequence is holding for MCS reconfiguration. Dragon copies of the big loop. So good news, the soft capture ring uh, has drawn in successfully, uh, but before we start to engage those hooks, we're going to do another reconfiguration of the MCS. That's the motion control system on board station um, during approach and initial contact. So during that uh, portion of flight, we are under all of our attitude controllers uh, being done by the Roscosmos segment. So we do that with any approaching visiting vehicle, but now that docking has occurred, we're going to hand over control back to the US gyroscopes, uh, which we do in our normal day-to-day -day attitude control. And so that puts station in a little bit more of a kind of quiescent mode. 
uh, won't be able to make any rapid adjustments that could interfere with the driving of those hooks. So as soon as the teams have confirmed that we've handed over attitude control over to the U.S. system, we'll be able to start driving in those 12 hooks to secure Dragon in place. Um, but I did just want to point out really briefly on the trunk there, you see a portion of it uh, that is darker, uh, black in color. That's actually the solar arrays that um, stay on, on board uh, Dragon and before the jettison, uh, before the trunk is jettisoned, rather. And so previous versions of Dragon had uh, solar arrays that expanded, right? Yes, they did um, expand almost like wings. Um, but in this version of Dragon, they stay attached. Um, no need to extend them. They stay right there on the trunk. Just as is? Yeah, absolutely. Station Easton on a big loop. Uh, MCS is configured, proceeding with hook driving. And we did. Station, we see it, thanks. We did hear that confirmation that the motion control system or N MCS has successfully been handed over. So now we're going to begin driving those hooks. Again, there's 12 in total. They'll drive in two groups of six. Takes about five minutes or so for the hooks to drive. And this is the second time uh, in the flight that we've done something with these hooks. They also are used shortly after liftoff once Dragon is inserted into uh, a nominal or normal orbit because they help to hold the nose cone closed during ascent. Uh, they uh, were used to open up and expose the nose cone which again, you see on your screen there is open and is required for Dragon to dock. That first set of hooks is continuing to drive. And here we have a view inside Endeavour. On the left is Commander of Create Matthew Dominic. Again, this is his first time uh, to space. Really looking forward to seeing him on board the International Space Station here. Um, about an hour and 45 minutes or so after uh, docking is when we're targeting hatch opening. It could be a little uh, sooner or a, a little bit later. It's a bit fluid. It depends how those leak checks go and uh, how long it takes to pressurize the vestibule. And so while those hooks drive, uh, the crew is going to remain in their uh, space suits. But once they work through a few more procedures, they will have the opportunity to get out of their seats and their suits and move freely about the cabin and essentially start to get ready to open up the hatches. They'll uh, hook up their suits to a couple of fans to help dry them actually before they get stowed. And again, they'll have a few tax tasks that they'll be working on uh, before they get ready to open up the hatch. What you're seeing on your screen is a view of Mission Control here in Hawthorne, California. This team is still currently monitoring the crew, even though they are attached to the International Space Station. We are currently in progress of hard capture. And they will still monitor the crew until they are safely on board the International Space Station, which even after hard capture, there are still a few events that need to happen. Um, pressurizing the vestibule that will keep both the Dragon spacecraft and International Space Station safe as it makes it, as they open up the hatch from Dragon to allow the crew eight members on board the International Space Station. And we do have confirmation that that first set of hooks has uh, been driven successfully. So now the next set is underway. And once that is complete, uh, that will be called a hard mate. A full seal is achieved with 12 hard capture hooks, hooks but uh, only 11 hooks are required to declare success um, in order to have a little bit of redundancy.
And if you are just joining us, uh, 10 minutes ago, Crew 8 docked to the International Space Station, the forward port of Harmony. Uh, they docked while the International Space Station and Dragon were flying over the North Atlantic, just east of New Finland. Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop. Heart capture is complete. Heart capture is on the big loop. And so we did hear that that second set of hooks was successfully driven. So we do have a hard capture, everything looking really good. Um, that's what we want to hear. That will allow us to move in, <clears throat> excuse me, to uh, the uh, hatch opening procedures. As Anna mentioned from Mission Control Houston, it, it will take a bit of time. They have to repressurize the vestibule before they can open up the hatches. But we are targeting hatch opening about an hour and 45 minutes following docking, which again occurred at 11.28 p.m. Pacific time this evening. And so once that vestibule is repressurized, uh, we may hear some communication back and forth about uh, a, a cartridge, a Lyo canister. Uh, this is a lithium hydrogen hydroxide canister uh, that is used to help scrub CO2 from the Dragon cabin during free flight. Um, so sometimes they'll remove that and seal it uh, before they enter uh, on board the International Space Station. This helps to integrate Dragon's cabin with the rest of the space station atmosphere. Uh, so not only will Dragon be able to use station power, uh, station data and communications, but also that air uh, will flow into Dragon and integrate with all of its other life support systems and generate oxygen scrubbing. Um, Dragon SpaceX on the big loop. Drag docking sequence is complete. So with that, Crew Dragon Endeavor, welcome to the International Space Station. We would also like to note that you can't be crew late when you arrive 30 minutes early. SpaceX, Dragon on the big loop. Copies all. So excited to be here. And uh, thank you to all the teams that got us here so much. Dragon from Elizabeth on board. Welcome to the International Space Station. We disagree. You still can be crew late. Uh, Mike, welcome back. We think a few things have changed since you left. Matt, Matt, Asha, you're going to absolutely love it here. Good to hear your voice, Jasmine, and looking forward to seeing you in just a moment. Absolutely. I'm both excited and sad because it means I'm leaving soon. <laughs> and those words from the ground up to the crew, uh, poking a little fun at them. We were watching the weather in the ascent corridor leading up to this uh, launch, so uh, we had to delay just a little bit. So no longer are they crew late, though, because they are on board station. Just looking for a go to doff suits. Dragon, you have a go to doff suits per 4.012. I will be bringing the cameras external shortly, and as we are going to target an expedited ingress, once the suits are doffed, I'll give you some updated instructions for 4.400. Dragon copies all.
Some great words there. The crew is now able to begin doffing their suits, which I'm sure they're pretty excited about after the journey to the International Space Station. Now that Dragon has completed the docking sequence, the spacecraft must undergo a handful of checks before we will be able to open the hatch. The crew on board Dragon will now get a chance to get out of their suits before moving into those hatch operations. That's right, and things will be picking up inside the space station too as NASA's Jasmine Mogbelli gets the hatch on the station side ready to be opened and starts pressurizing that area known as the vestibule between the Dragon and station hatches. With Dragon docked, that's going to do it for us here in Hawthorne, but our coverage for Crew 8 won't stop there. Uh, be sure to uh, continue tuning in from Mission Control Houston. Uh, we're going to toss it over to Anna and Mission Control Houston to take us through the vestibule depressurization and hatch opening. Uh, we'll, and we'll see uh, NASA astronauts Matthew Dominic, Michael Barrett, Jeanette Epps, and Alexander Gerbenkin float into the International Space Station. Um, but for us here in Hawthorne, that is going to do it. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Welcome aboard, Crew 8.
It was great to see Dragon safely dock to the International Space Station to bring another crew of astronauts aboard to conduct important science and research over the next six months. Again, Dragon Endeavor docked to the International Space Station. And we just heard confirmation from NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, who is inside the International Space Station and working on those hatch opening operations. She just confirmed that the hatch on node 2 forward has been opened and this will allow her to have access inside the pressurized mating adapter. Next dragon turning around. Go ahead, dragon. Uh, the driver for uh, expedited ingress is not as strong as necessary. It's just we don't have to go crazy. Copy that. Station on the big loop, a patch equalization valve closed at 0752. All right, copy that. Dragon SpaceX on Dragon to ground. If desired, you can reference procedure 4.400 for monitoring vestibule pressurization. That would be section 4. We are continuing to work through some hatch opening procedures. NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli is primed for these procedures. She has already opened the large hatch at node 2 forward to give her access inside the pressurized mating adapter. Now we are working to pressurize the vestibule. It's X Dragon now on the bed loop. We heard you make a call and turn it around with overfly. Uh, that's correct. It was just directing you towards four decimal. Section 4 to monitor vestibule pressurization. Um, we have a little bit of trouble with the audio link on Dragnet Ground right now, so you can just direct all calls on Big Loop. Copy, we'll go stay on the Big Loop and uh, we're monitoring Section 4, uh, 4. 400.
Again, they are currently working to pressurize the vestibule. The vestibule is the small space between the hatches on Dragon and the space station. This area was previously exposed to the vacuum of space prior to docking, and we need to fill it with air and make sure its pressure is nearly equal with the atmospheric pressures on both Dragon and the space station. You just heard some calls between the crew on the big loop. The crew on Dragon is monitoring this pressurization process. As part of these pressurization procedures, NASA astronaut Jasmine McBelly, who is on the International Space Station and a part of Expedition 70, is using a small valve on the station's hatch to slowly introduce air into the vestibule, and flight controllers here in Houston are monitoring the pressure and temperature readings inside and verifying that everything is leak-free before we can open the hatches. You are getting a great view of Dragon docked to the International Space Station. Docking occurred just about 30 minutes ago at 1.28 a.m. Central Time, 2.28 a.m. Eastern Time, and we are currently working through hatch opening procedures. This includes a vestibule pressurization, which is currently taking place. This requires the small space between the hatches on Dragon and the space station to be pressurized so that it's nearly equal with the atmospheric pressures on both Dragon and the space station. NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli is currently working through these procedures and she is using a small valve on the station's hatch to slowly introduce air into the vestibule and flight controllers here in Houston are monitoring this pressurization process. The entire hatch opening and pressurization process can take a couple of hours. Um, we're currently looking to a hatch opening uh, to occur a little bit after 3 a.m. Central Time, 4 a.m. Eastern Time. And then following hatch opening, the crew will configure Dragon for on-orbit operations and will also get a safety briefing. And as soon as the crew is on board the International Space Station, we will also have a welcoming ceremony with all four Crew-8 astronauts, as well as the seven astronauts and cosmonauts currently aboard the International Space Station, eager, eagerly awaiting Crew-8 to open the hatch and welcome them on board to bring the population of the International Space Station to 11 members for the next few days.
Dragon, SpaceX on the big loop, ISS power connection established. Dragon copies the big loop. Suits are drying uh, one minute ago. Copy, suit drying is started. And you just heard some communication with flight controllers here on the ground and the Dragon crew aboard the Dragon Endeavor. They have taken off their suits and they are uh, have configured them so that they can dry and they are continuing to monitor the pressurization taking place right now in the vestibule. There are also leak checks going on as part of this process. The crew currently aboard the Dragon Endeavour spacecraft includes NASA astronauts Matthew Dominic, Michael Barrett, and Jeanette Epps, as well as Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Grabenkin. It is a first space flight for Dominic, Epps, and Grabenkin, but a third flight for Barrett. He has previously spent 212 days in space, having Dragon SpaceX on the big loop with suits drying. You have a go for 4.400. All of the steps in this procedure are going to be optional for the um, expedited ingress. We are still going to take the expedited pathway. However, do complete as much of that as you can while we are in the interim period uh, for the leak check that is currently in progress. And copies go for all of 4.400, and uh, it's all optional. Again, the crew aboard Dragon continue to monitor, continuing to monitor the hatch opening procedures, and NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli aboard the International Space Station working through those procedures and the pressurization of the vestibule. Once the hatches are open and Crew 8 is officially welcomed aboard the International Space Station, it'll bring the population of the International Space Station from 7 to 11 crew members for the next few days as Crew 8 and Crew 7 complete a brief handover period. They will be joining the Expedition 70 crew currently aboard the International Space Station, which includes NASA astronauts Jasmine Mogbelli and Laurel O'Hara, as well as ESA or European Space Agency astronaut Andreas Mogensen and JAXA or Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Satoshi Furukawa and Roscosmos cosmonauts Konstantin Borisov, Oleg Kononenko, and Nikolai Chub. We are currently in a brief but expected handover period between satellites. The International Space Station relies on communications from the Tracking and Data Relay Satellite System, or TDRS. And right now you can see a live look inside the International Space Station flight control room here in Houston. The flight control team right now is being led by NASA Flight Director Paul Kanya, and next to him is the CAPCOM or Capsule Communicator, Neil Nagata. The CAPCOM serves as the voice link between the NASA Mission Control Team and the crew aboard the International Space Station. 
the NASA team is responsible for the safety of the crew aboard the space station as well as the station itself. It's staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and the flight control team operates on three shifts per day or orbits to provide continuous support for the crew. As we are in integrated operations with the SpaceX mission control team based in Hawthorne, California, that team is responsible for monitoring Dragon and its systems. They have a MD or the mission director, which is responsible for mission success and leads the team, and also a core or crew operations and resources engineer, which is who you often hear talking to the Dragon crew during their transit to the International Space Station. Following a launch at 9.53 p.m. Central, 10.53 p.m. Eastern on Sunday, March 3rd, the Crew-8 astronauts riding aboard the Dragon Endeavour spacecraft successfully docked to the International Space Station at 1.28 a.m. Central, 2.28 a.m. Eastern as the space station and Dragon were traveling over the North Atlantic just east of Newfoundland. We are currently working through some hatch opening procedures and NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, who is currently aboard the International Space Station, is primed for these hatch opening operations and working through the uh, vestibule pressurization process. Crew Dragon Endeavour is also now configured to receive power from the International Space Station through the Node 2 forward International Docking Adapter umbilical co uh, connections. And vestibule leak checks are also underway.
Again, we are continuing to work through hatch opening operations following a docking at 1.28 a.m. Central to 28 a.m. Eastern. Once Crew 8 is on board, there will be a brief welcoming cer ceremony with Crew 8 along with the rest of the Expedition 70 crew currently on board the International Space Station, including NASA astronauts Jasmine Mugbelli and Laurel O'Hara. ESA or European Space Agency astronaut Andreas Mogensen, who is also currently the space station's commander, JAXA or Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronauts Toshi Furukawa and Ross Cosmos, cosmonauts Konstantin Borisov, Oleg Kononenko, and Nikolai Chub. The crew will then get a safety briefing and begin handover activities with the members of NASA's SpaceX Crew-7 mission, which includes Jasmine Mugbelli, Andreas Mogensen, Satoshi Furukawa, and Konstantin Borisov. And after those brief handover activities and that brief handover period, Crew-7 will undock from the International Space Station and splash down off the coast of Florida. Crew 8 will then work to conduct new scientific research to prepare for human exploration beyond low Earth orbit. They will contribute to more than 200 different experiments and technology demonstrations while aboard the International Space Station for their approximately six month journey aboard the space station. One of those experiments, known as H-Bond, or Human Brain Organoid Models for Neurodegenerative Disease and Drug Discovery, studies the mechanisms behind neuroinflammation, which is a common feature of neurodegenerative disorders. Researchers create organoids using patient-derived iPSCs or induce, induce pluripotent stem cells from patients who have Parkinson's disease and primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Results from this study could help improve diagnostics, provide insights into the effects of aging, accelerate drug discovery, and identify therapeutic targets for patients suffering from neurodegenerative diseases. The organoid models could also provide a way to anticipate how extended spaceflight affects the brain and support development of countermeasures. They will also be working on an experiment known as plant UVB, or plant responses against the stresses of microgravity and high ultraviolet radiation in space, which examines how stress from microgravity, UV radiation, and the combination of the two affect plants at the molecular, cellular, and whole organism levels. Results from this study could increase understanding of plant growth in space and support improvements in plant cultivation technologies for future missions. We are currently in a brief but expected handover period, and we should be getting signal back from the International Space Station in just a minute or so. The Tracking and Data Relay Satellite System, or TDRS, is NASA's network of specialized communication satellites in geosynchronous orbit that provide communication services to the International Space Station. These satellites relay signals between spacecraft, including the International Space Station and ground control stations on Earth.
And there you can see live views inside the International Space Station of NASA astronaut Jasmine Mobelli in Node 2 forward as she works through some of those hatch opening procedures. Following a docking at 1.28 a.m. Central this morning, 2.28 a.m. Eastern, Jasmine Mogbelli went to work to begin these hatch opening procedures, including securing some hardware. And then she moved to open the large hatch at Node 2 forward, which is the area you're seeing now, to give her access inside the pressurized mating adapter. We then, be then began to pressurize the vestibule, which is the small space between the hatches on Dragon and the space station. This area was exposed to the vacuum of space prior to docking, so we needed to fill it with air and make sure its pressure was nearly equal with the atmospheric pressures on Dragon and the station. To do this, Jasmine Mogbelli used a small valve on the station's hatch to slowly introduce air into the vestibule. And flight controllers here in Mission Control Houston monitor the pressure and temperature readings inside to verify that everything is leak free before we get to open the hatches. Those leak checks are currently ongoing. You are seeing live views of the Dragon Endeavour spacecraft as it's docked to the International Space Station. It docked just under an hour ago at 1.28 a.m. Central, 2.28 a.m. Eastern Time. Crew 8 is currently aboard the Dragon Endeavour, preparing for a hatch opening a short time for now to join the Expedition 70 crew currently aboard the International Space Station. Crew 8 comprised of NASA astronauts Matthew Dominic, Michael Barrett, and Jeanette Epps, as well as Ross Cosmos cosmonaut Alexander Grabenkin, make up the Crew 8 complement. And Crew 8 is the eighth crew rotation mission on Dragon and the ninth flight with astronauts, including the Demo 2 test flight to the International Space Station through NASA's commercial crew program. Liftoff of Crew 8 atop a Falcon 9 rocket occurred at 9.53 p.m. Central, 10.53 p.m. Eastern on Sunday, March 3rd, and they had an approximately 28-hour transit to the International Space Station, where they are currently docked.
and you are seeing live views inside the International Space Station as the Expedition 70 crew works to welcome the Crew 8 astronauts aboard the International Space Station. On the far left side is International Space Station Commander and European Space Agency astronaut, or ESA, Andreas Mogensen. And then to the right is NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli. And Andreas Mogensen, currently on your screen, is currently working through some CASA or crew alternate sleep accommodation move-in procedures. This basically requires him to remove CASA from stowage into the sleep configuration. CASA is used when we have extra crew members on board. And since we are about to bring the population of the International Space Station from 7 to 11, it'll be used to sleep some of those extra crew members for the next few days. And currently on your screen, you can see JAXA or Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency astronaut Satoshi Furukawa. He is part of Crew 7, and he will be completing a handover period with the Crew 8 astronauts before he and the rest of his Crew 7 crewmates return to Earth in just a few days. And only an hour ago, 
the Dragon Endeavour spacecraft carrying Crew 8 docked to the International Space Station. This docking took place at 1.28 a.m. Central to 2.28 a.m. Eastern as Dragon and the International Space Station were flying over the North Atlantic just east of Newfoundland. Teams continue to work through some of the hatch opening operations. This process can take about two hours to complete. Once the hatches are open, there will be a brief welcome ceremony as Crew 8 is officially welcomed aboard by the rest of the Expedition 70 crew. And following the welcoming ceremony, there will also be an ISS safety briefing for the Crew-8 astronauts. And then they will also take time to integrate Dragon into the station environment. To do that, they have to complete a few tasks to prepare Dragon for docked operations, including removing the LIO or lithium hydroxide canister used during free flight. Station Dragon, Houston on a big loop. Uh, after some coordination here, uh, we're going to get the hatch open with the expedited path, and then uh, we're going to go ahead and shoot for a PAO event at uh, around 0900. We're just finalizing some leak checks down here on the ground. Houston copies. Houston copies. And you just heard some conversation between flight controllers here on the ground and the space station and Dragon crews. They are currently targeting a welcoming ceremony to take place at 3 a.m. Central, and the hatches will open a little bit before that, probably approximately at 2.45 a.m. Central. Teams are just continuing to finalize some leak checks before that official hatch opening can take place. Station Houston on a big loop for JAWS and uh, hatch opening. With you on two? With you on the big loop? Hey, JAWS, uh, we're ready for you to pick up in your activity at 9.05 with the Deltas as frag. Okay, copy. I have a go and step through decimal one. If Six, Dragon on the big loop for Go ahead, Dragon. It just timing wise, they're telling us PAO event zero uh, nine Zulu, and uh, that is almost exactly at the same time that the seats would be done drawing with one hour. So we will give you the seat fan off command five alpha dot six. Concur. We are already tracking that. Uh, I also have a couple items for you. First of which is, uh, can we come on back on board with cameras? Stand by one, SpaceX. Copy, standing by. Houston Station on the big loop, I'm showing DPTT approximately zero, proceeding with step three, decimal three. Yeah, copy, concur.
NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, who you can see currently on your screen in node two forward, is currently continuing to work through hatch opening procedures. She is currently completing the vestibule equalization process, and then the opening of the A-pass hatch will take place. And floating onto your screen now is NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara. Checking on the big loop. You are welcome to come aboard. Copy that. I'll bring the cameras uh, back internal here shortly. Um, two other items, just so I am prepared for what we have to do after the PAO event. Uh, what have you completed in 4.400? Stand by one moment. Next dragon on the big loop. Go for SpaceX. Status report 4.400. Section 1 completes. Section 2 completes. Section 3, we are going to uh, hold on 3.71. We're going to do the expedited. We're not going to do 3.1 right away. Uh, section 4, we're monitoring. And then Section 5, uh, we might be able to do 5 decimal 1, uh, depending on how soon this hatch opens up, but we're not sure. All right, copy all. Uh, you can actually defer Section 5 until after um, you re-enter to finish the configuration. No concerns there. Just be aware that um, we will not have the hatch seal covers installed, um, nor are we going to install the IMV duct, so um, just like be careful as you're, as you're translating. And then um, final item for that hatch configuration, we are going to skip the LIO closeout as well. We're just accepting the extra consumption of the currently installed LIO canister. Um, with that, you can proceed to section six and wait for our call once the APAS hatch is open. Copy. We are uh, in section six right now, standing by ISS group. And you heard some continued conversations between the Dragon crew and teams here on the ground as they work through some of these docked operations ahead of hatch opening. There was mention of LIO, which is the lithium hydroxide canister that's used during free flight to scrub carbon dioxide from Dragon's atmosphere. Additionally, 
they will complete some do uh, tasks to prepare Dragon for docked operations later today, which include installing some protective covers over the Dragon hatch and the seal around the hatchway. And here we are getting live views inside Dragon. You can see that the crew has removed their flight, their suits and are in their blue flight suits awaiting hatch opening. At the top of your screen, you can see NASA astronaut Jeanette Epps. And down toward the bottom of the screen, on the left side, we have NASA astronaut Michael Barrett, and to his right, we have NASA astronaut Matthew Dominic, and we can also see uh, Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Grabenkin. Houston Station on the big loop, APAS hatch is open and no condensation. No copy. And you just heard confirmation from NASA astronaut Jasmine Mogbelli, who has been working through those hatch opening procedures. She has confirmed that the APAS hatch is open. And in just a few minutes, we should see the hatch of Dragon open and welcome the Crew-8 crew members aboard the International Space Station. Crew-8 began their journey to the International Space Station on Sunday, March 3rd, following a launch from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida at Launch Complex 39A. They launched atop a Falcon 9 rocket at 9.53 p.m. Central, 10.53 p.m. Eastern, and have been on a, an approximately 28-hour journey to the International Space Station, where they docked just over an hour ago at 1.28 a.m. Central, 2.28 a.m. Eastern. They've been working through these hatch opening procedures to equalize the vestibule, um, do some leak checks and ensure everything is good to go before the hatches on Dragon are open to officially welcome Crew-8 aboard. Crew-8 is comprised of NASA astronauts Matthew Dominic, Michael Barrett, and Jeanette Epps, as well as Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Grabenkin. It's a first space flight for Dominic, Epps, and Grabenkin, and a third flight for Barrett. Once on board, they will complete a brief welcome ceremony with the rest of the Expedition 70 crew, and then they will have a space station safety briefing before they jump right into handover activities with the Crew-7 crew members for the next few days before Crew-7 makes its way back home to Earth to complete their approximately six-month journey aboard the International Space Station. Houston, SpaceX from station on the big loop. Station is ready for Dragon Hatch equalization. Houston, SpaceX, Dragon is ready for hatch equalization. Dragon, SpaceX, we copy.
Station Dragon Houston on a big loop. Standby for equalization. It's expected to take about two minutes. And then uh, be advised that after uh, the hatch is open, the target base plate on the APAS hatch won't be covered. So uh, exercise caution when translating past it. Dragon SpaceX on the big loop, you are go for hatch opening per decal. SpaceX Dragon on the big loop. And we just heard confirmation that they are go for hatch opening. We should see crew eight welcome to board in just a minute or two.
following a docking earlier this morning at 1.28 a.m. Central to 2.28 a.m. Eastern Time. We have worked through the hatch opening procedures, including the vestibule pressurization. And now we are standing by for crew eight to come aboard. Copy, hatch open. And we just heard confirmation that the Dragon hatch is open, so we should see those Crew 8 crew members float aboard shortly. Currently on your screen, you can see JAXA, or Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, astronaut Satoshi Furukawa on the far left. In the center is ESA, or European Space Agency astronaut Andreas Mogensen, and also there was NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara. They were working to set up for the welcoming ceremony that will take place shortly after Crew-8 uh, floats aboard. And now you are seeing a live view inside the Dragon Endeavour spacecraft. You can see the SpaceX suits that the Crew-8 crew members were wearing for the docking operations, as well as for launch on Sunday, March 3rd. Create is currently standing by, and they will be ingressing into the International Space Station just a short time from now. And there we can see Crew 8 being joyfully welcomed aboard the International Space Station. First aboard was NASA astronaut Matthew Dominic, followed behind him NASA astronaut Michael Barrett and NASA astronaut Jeanette Epps. And pulling up the end, we have Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Grabenkin. The Crew-8 astronauts now officially a part of Expedition 70 and the other Expedition 70 crew members giving them hugs and handshakes as they make their way onto the International Space Station, which will be their home for the next six months as they conduct important science and research. With Crew-8 officially on board, we're now just standing by for some welcoming remarks from the crew. And we are currently in a brief but expected handover period. We will get signal back shortly and get those views back of the International Space Station crew.
Station Houston Space to Ground 2. Uh, picture looks good. There's a cable that's uh, taking up the, from our perspective, is the upper right side, maybe about in the top uh, 20% of the screen. See if we can get that moved a little bit. We are in another brief but expected handover period between satellites, and we should get views back of the International Space Station in just a minute. The tracking and data relay satellite system is NASA's network of specialized communication satellites, and these satellites relay signals between spacecraft, including the International Space Station and ground control stations on Earth. Once we get communication back with the International Space Station, that welcoming ceremony with Crew 8 and the rest of the Expedition 70 crew will begin. Station, this is Houston on Space to Ground 2. Are you ready for the event? All right, let's roll. All right, stand by, stand by. Andy, sorry about that. Can you give us uh, a little count on the microphone? We weren't getting the audio down here.
check. Okay, just a, another quick count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, <laughs> eight, nine, ten. All right, 11, 12, 13, we're ready to roll. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, a big warm welcome to Crew 8 uh, from all of us up here. Uh, wouldn't you know it, after having made fun of Crew 8 for being, or for launching late, they arrive early to the space station and have us uh, scrambling this morning. <laughs> but it's absolutely fantastic to see their smiling faces. Um, welcome to space. Uh, Matt, Jeanette, and uh, Alex, and welcome back to space to uh, Mike. Um, this is uh, also for Crew 7, a, a slightly bittersweet moment because with their arrival, it also starts the countdown to our own uh, departure and return to Earth in uh, about a week's time. But it's great to see Crew 8. Uh, welcome. You guys are going to have a fantastic mission, I I'm sure of it, um, and we look forward to spending the next week in space with you and uh, for uh, Laurel, Oleg and Nikolai, there you are, uh, a few more weeks. Uh, but uh, welcome to you and I'll pass the mic uh, to you, Matt. Thank you so much. Uh, we are of course super excited to be here and after we saw you uh, call us out yesterday, we phoned a few friends to expedite things to kind of throw you off guard on purpose. <laughs> or so we hope or wished. Anyway, we're so excited to be here. A uh, big thank you to everyone uh, who helped put this together, such a giant team around the world. And uh, we're excited to be on board and ready to take over the watch. Over to you, Mike. Well, first thing, it's just great to be back. There's such a, a sense of familiarity and homeness uh, to the station. And I uh, can't wait to get back to work, but just a big shout out to all the folks who got us up here to NASA. Our friends at uh, SpaceX for building a great little spaceship and a little taste of the flexibility this morning that we'll be expecting over the next six months. I know that our flight's going to go by in a blink of an eye and uh, really anxious to start. Thanks for the very warm welcome from Crew 7. I second everything that um, Matt and Mike has said, and I just want to thank my family as well for being patient with me, and I'm, I made it here. Awesome. Всем привет с орбиты. Ну что, мы добрались. Полет был достаточно легким, поэтому надеюсь, что и продолжение будет подобным. Всем спасибо и всем передаю большой привет. Thanks, thanks a lot, all teams. Well, once again, uh, welcome to the National Space Station. This is uh, an incredible place. Uh, you will have a great time up here just like we did. Uh, we are doing so much exciting science at the moment uh, and we look forward to introducing you to all of it. So once again, welcome Crew 8. All right, uh, thanks Station for all of that. I can tell you on behalf of us that are left here on the planet, we are incredibly proud to be part of this and we're all smiling down here. All right, Station, we are now resuming operational communications. And there you have it, Crew 8 is officially on board the International Space Station and welcomed by the Expedition 70 crew, bringing the current space station population to 11 for the next few days. Crew 8 began their journey to the orbiting laboratory following a liftoff at 9.53 p.m. Central, 10.53 p.m. Eastern on Sunday, March 3rd from launch pad 39A at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida atop a Falcon 9 rocket. Following orbital insertion, the Dragon vehicle carrying Crew-8 completed a series of automatic maneuvers to guide the spacecraft to the forward-facing port of the station's Harmony module. 
Dragon Endeavor and its four-person crew of NASA astronauts Matthew Dominic, Michael Barrett, and Jeanette Epps, and Roscosmos cosmonaut Alexander Grabenkin docked to the International Space Station at 1.28 a.m. Central, 2.28 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, March 5th, as the space station and Dragon were traveling over the North Atlantic, just east of Newfoundland. Once the vestibule was pressurized and a series of leak checks were performed, the hatches were opened and Crew 8 was officially welcomed aboard the International Space Station, where they will spend the next six months docked to the orbiting laboratory, conducting new scientific research and experiments. Thank you for joining us for our Crew 8 coverage this morning. Go NASA, go SpaceX, and go Crew 8. This is Mission Control Houston. It's a new era of pioneers, star sailors, thinkers, and adventurers. Three, two, one, zero, all engine running. Let's go.